My name is Wendell Wilkie, and I've been asked to moderate the uh, second panel on implementation of ESG uh, strategies. So we're following the uh, legal and academic analysis by uh, eminently practical uh, discussion of uh, investment strategies by a very distinguished panel. And let me uh, just introduce them now. Uh, to my immediate left is Michelle Edkins. Uh, a managing director and global head of BlackRock's investment stewardship, stewardship team um, of over 30 specialists covering the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. Sounds like the globe. Uh, Ms. Edkins is responsible for the team's engagement as well as proxy voting activities in relation to the companies in which BlackRock's, BlackRock invests on behalf of its clients. And I think you're invested in how many thousand? Companies. That's 15,000. 15,000. So that's a fair number of proxies to review on an annual on an annual basis. She also serves on the firm's global operating human capital and government relations steering committees. So to Michelle's immediate left is Eva Zlotnika, vice president of Value Act Capital. Uh, she is Eva was their first dedicated ESG and sustainability hire. Uh, she's a director of Unify. Uh, in which Value Act has a substantial uh, position through its Spring Fund investment team. Eva started on Wall Street uh, 15 years ago as a um, uh, sell side equity research analyst focused on ESG, first at UBS, then Morgan Stanley, before moving uh, to Value Act. And immediately to her left is Charlie Penner, a partner at Jana Partners. Together with Dan Hansen is running Jana's new impact invest, investing fund, uh, Jana Impact Capital. Charlie originated and led Jana's first impact investment, uh, impact investing campaign earlier this year in which Jana and Calsters, uh, as you may recall, strongly encouraged Apple to update the parental controls on Apple's mobile devices to address the negative mental health outcomes resulting from overuse by children obviously a concern of virtually every parent uh, in the room, and uh, this initiative I know attracted extraordinary publicity. I think I heard about it on WCBS, Charlie, so it made, made some waves, and we look forward to hearing about that. Uh, prior to joining Jana in 2005, Charlie worked at GE, uh, Cravath, Swain, and Moore, and Schulte Roth, and uh, before law school worked in communications on Capitol Hill, which probably has some relevance to his uh, current uh, endeavors. And to his left is uh, Rocky Kumar, Senior Managing Director and Head of ESG Investments and Asset Stewardship at State Street Global Advisors. As Head of ESG Investments, Rocky leads their efforts to strengthen integration of environmental, social, and governments, governance factors into the investment process. She is responsible for developing the firm's ESG investment philosophy and global business strategy. As head of asset stewardship, she oversees all of SSGA's proxy voting and engagement activities and is responsible for developing SSGA's thought leadership and voting guidelines in this area. And uh, your assets under management, Rocky, are? It's about 2.7 trillion. And you're invested in how many companies globally? Uh, over 10,000. Yeah. So uh, I think a tremendous breadth of perspective that we'll hear about today. So just following up on our first panel, obviously this is an area of increasing interest. I think many of you probably saw the entire issue of Barron's devoted to ESG investing uh, just a few months ago. There's clearly a tremendous increase in demand for opportunities in this, in this space. So especially at a time when there's increasing focus on index investing, uh, investors are looking also for the altern alternative of investing in sustainability and social responsibility um, investment strategies. Uh, on the supply side, companies we know are making increasingly detailed disclosure, um, uh, I think resulting from, for lots of different reasons. Uh, and as has been discussed, we've seen studies that show, and obviously the evidence is ambiguous, it could evolve over time, but uh, the potential for superior results uh, for companies and funds uh, who uh, perform well in this uh, space. Uh, and also, and just in terms of the risk management side, companies that don't 
uh, meet certain broader expectations, uh, pose greater uh, uh, compliance uh, and, uh, and uh, broader uh, risk, which can uh, have a deleterious impact on enterprise value. So as a personal note, I look at this from the uh, issuer's side. I spent over 20 years as a general counsel of a multinational manufacturing company, Mead West Faco, and also had responsibility for a number of years for safety, health, and environment communications and, and government relations. Uh, we devoted a lot of attention uh, to this space. We had a dedicated PS, a PhD whose primary responsibility was ensuring compliance with the requirements of the pretty comprehensive uh, Dow Jones Sustainability uh, Index, and our efforts in this area were led uh, by the former head of um, environmental uh, uh, oversight for the, uh, for the state of Virginia, who was a, you know, who played a, a leadership role in national policy in this area. So I found, you know, every year when we would uh, issue our sustainability report with great public relations fanfare, I would go to our head of investor relations and say, you know, what's, what's the feedback from investors and, uh, you know, what questions are you getting? And he invariably said, Wendell, we're not getting any questions from, uh, from investors about our sustainability performance. Now, this perspective is somewhat dated, and, uh, you know, I must say that we benefited from substantial engagement from three major investors who knew the company well, I think who had good assurance of our performance in this space. And so his perspective, I think, related more to that of, uh, uh, you know, mutual funds who had a smaller position uh, in the company. But the primary reason that we, and I think this would be true more broadly for issuers, uh, to provide comprehensive reporting in this space, uh, at least until recently, was less to address the concern of investors than to speak to other uh, constituencies. Uh, preeminently uh, customers, especially if you were in a B2C space. Uh, regulators, if you inevitably had a compliance problem, you wanted to demonstrate that you had strong commitment uh, to uh, sustainability in your uh, overall performance. And uh, obviously communities where you operated and your employees for whom this is a motivational uh, factor. And then also uh, of consequence, uh, your board of, of directors. Uh, we were privileged to have a, a number of prominent board members and we, our safety, health, and environment committee met frequently. And from the standpoint of, of directors, there's always, you know, there's commentary today about how boards are under pressure to uh, uh, deliver, uh, to enhance a company's short-term financial performance. But from the standpoint of, of uh, I think, uh, sophisticated and experienced directors, uh, they have a very strong motivation in ensuring that their company performs well in this, in the area of safety, health, and environment, sustainability, ESG, uh, call it uh, what you will, uh, because they have a sense of, uh, of, of responsibility uh, for the company. They don't like to hear about accidents. They don't like to hear about significant compliance problems. Uh, they are keenly concerned about the company's uh, reputation uh, just because that's a matter of their own personal motivation and uh, you know they certainly are not interested in seeing the company and as a consequence the board uh, embarrassed. So um, you know I think back to you know this is not we had some uh, perspective on the history in this space how uh, Paul O'Neill when he became uh, CEO of Alco I think in 1987 uh, made a very strong impression at a first investor conference when he said his number one priority as CEO of Alcoa, the world's largest aluminum company, was to improve its safety uh, performance and that he thought that that would drive improved financial uh, results. I think people were startled by O'Neill's presentation, but his, uh, his prediction proved true. Alcoa's safety performance at that point in time was no worse than industry standards. 
but he viewed any accidents in the workplace uh, uh, as measured in total case incident rate, which is uh, a measure of uh, accidents which require medical, some form of medical attention as unacceptable. And so through his leadership, uh, the company drove down its reportable incidents 90%, so they were 10% of what they'd been a few years earlier. And while causation is always problematic, there's, there's uh, no question that in terms of enterprise value and reported earnings, uh, Alco Alcoa delivered dramatically in that period of time. Now, there may very well have been very substantial macroeconomic factors uh, at work, other uh, matters of uh, execution um, by, by management, but it's, uh, it, it does make sense if you've had the experience inside uh, a major uh, manufacturing uh, company. I think you know, John Hess, who's on the next panel, can speak eloquently to this. If your employees know that you're committed to their safety and you'll take whatever measures are required uh, to enhance uh, their safety, uh, it's a measure of your respect for the dignity of each individual in, your, in the workplace and the improved uh, performance that results from the confidence and the respect for the dignity of individuals in the workplace uh, has longer term uh, benefits for the enterprise, which does translate into improved uh, financial uh, performance. So uh, I would just like now to um, turn to um, you know, each, of, each of the panelists to talk about, just to provide their informal perspective on ESG uh, investment strategies as they see it. And I, but I would like them also to ask sort of one overarching uh, question. And, and that is obviously, as, you know, as we heard previously, there are a plethora of uh, standards uh, which have been developed by competing um, NGOs in this space. Companies have to make elections as to which it may depend on the industry that you're in, but there are lots of different ways uh, that companies can uh, report in this space. There's a lack of uniformity, and there is also, um, it's, it's, it's also uh, difficult to generalize uh, across industries or even within industries because the circumstances of individual businesses could vary from one uh, to the next. So that means that there's, uh, there's no substitute for making qualitative uh, judgments within the uh, range of reported uh, ESG uh, performance results for a given company. Now, in some cases, a company may clearly be an outlier um, and either in terms of its performance on the high end or on the other end, a lack of disclosure and, you know, a, a poor environmental performance and the like. But for the broad range of companies in the middle, I think you would find very few in industries of relevance that today do not do some form of sustainability uh, reporting. And uh, so, just like every company has a, a code of conduct, which is effectively required by the uh, uh, sentencing guidelines, well, there's the, the marketplace equivalent increasingly today uh, when it comes to measuring uh, sustainability and, and ESG performance. And, but unlike financial reporting, uh, there's a lack of uniformity, so uh, the application of qualitative judgment is, um, is clearly required. So I would therefore ask when I turn to each member of the panel to, to speak to their own approach, uh, to their fund's own approach to, to ESG, uh, how do you know uh, when what you're seeing uh, from a company is real and, uh, and, not, uh, and not smoke? And um, with that, let me just turn it over to my fellow panelists. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So uh, BlackRock Investment Stewardship um, and the work that the team does is largely informed by the fact that 90% of the equity investments that BlackRock makes on behalf of our clients are in index strategies. So by definition, our clients are long-term locked-in investors. And that's important when you talk about ESG and framing ESG conversations 
because environmental and social considerations that are core to how companies manage their businesses, operate their businesses, and generate returns tend to play out over the long term. So you can cut corners for a few quarters, but doing that consistently over a few years is likely to result in outcomes that are not good for the financial sustainability of the company and therefore not good for our clients as long-term investors. And so it's through that lens that we integrate ESG factors into uh, the work that the investment stewardship team does. We predominantly look at governance because, in our experience, with absent a strong board and strong leadership, it doesn't matter how beautiful the disclosures are about environmental and social impacts, there's often a not a lot of substance behind them. So we need to see that there's sound leadership, a sound strategy, that operational practices meet, meet high standards. When it comes to your question about disclosure, I mean, I, I think that's something we've all been grappling with for a long time. And you know, as you may recall, we invest in 15,000 companies on behalf of our clients, which means we have to try and filter that very large universe to identify those companies where our engagement, our having a conversation with the company will encourage it to think about adopting better business practices that we think will contribute to superior financial returns. And so in that filtering, we really are seeking some level of consistency and comparability across that universe. And so we are encouraged by some of the um, services provided by data aggregators and so on, but they can only aggregate data that's as good as companies disclose. And so obviously we're a little bit of a chicken and egg situation here. Um, I think there's a lot of work that is being done both on the issuer side or the reporter side and the investor side of the equation around what information is relevant to investment decision making. And, and Bob Eccles has done some really interesting work around um, you know, companies need to choose their material audience, the audience they're trying to communicate with first and foremost, and then identify the information, the data that's most relevant to that audience. And in that way, you're making your communications most effective. And as an investor, obviously, we're seeking information that's investment decision relevant, so we're um, working very closely with the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board to develop the work that they're doing, which is sector-based. I um, mean, we're also encouraged by a number of industry groups that are developing um, industry-specific disclosure recommendations, such as, as the Edison Institute has done for the utility industry. So I think there's a lot of great work going on. We do depend on companies telling us what's material to their business in terms of operating and, and, risk, and uh, risk management. Um, and I think through the engagement dialogue, it is actually relatively straightforward to get a sense of what's substantive and what's um, decorative, shall we say. Could I just quickly follow up on that? You and I had a very interesting conversation yesterday. And obviously, you've got a huge challenge in monitoring so many uh, companies, and obviously some require greater attention than others, but I thought what you had to say about uh, expecting companies uh, to address what was material in their disclosure uh, in this space, which may not have an impact on the immediate and short term, but has longer term implications consistent with the longer term perspective that BlackRock emphasizes. And I'm just wondering if you could expand a bit about uh, your engagement in terms of pursuing greater disclosure around material issues? Yeah, so in, in the context of our ESG engagement, we're looking at materiality not in a financial sense of a percentage of revenue impact type of um, thinking, but on, we're asking companies to highlight for us um, the aspects of their business that are core to how the business is operated and how it generates revenue, how it creates opportunity. And so to get, make that a tangible example, um, for a company that is water dependent, we, want the, we, know, we find it helpful for management to, ex, to explain firstly that it is water dependent in its operating processes, um, and then explain how it is innovating to ensure that it's having minimum impact on 
water usage, um, that they're adapting production processes, product design, and so on for minimal impact. Because ultimately, and I say this as someone who used to live in the state of California, um, ultimately, if you're operating a manufacturing plant in a water-stressed state, and more and more states are water-stressed, and you're wasting water, you will find that regulators and um, local government who give you literally the license to have that operating plant there may rescind that right. And that makes this a business critical issue. This is not an environmental issue, although it has an environmental component. It's a business critical issue because if you can't make your product, you can't make money. So do you have any sense, and maybe it's, it's early to speak to this, but whether the enhanced disclosure uh, that you're looking for, and I think, for example, how you came out on the ExxonMobil uh, proxy uh, vote a year ago on uh, their, expo their uh, disclosure, whether they'd be required to disclose what the impact would be of additional regulation uh, in, in carbon emissions. Do you have any sense as to whether your engagement around greater disclosure is producing a better performance results in terms of uh, ESG criteria. I think it, you know the the example of the Exxon vote is an example of a multi-year engagement where we started having conversation, and then over time we ultimately, in oh no, several years' time, we ultimately voted against management by voting for a shareholder proposal to encourage enhanced disclosure. The company published at the beginning of this year a much more detailed report, and clearly we weren't the only shareholders signalling this to the company, which is why the shareholder proposal passed, um, and. What I think companies benefit from, and we certainly hear this anecdotally from companies, that they do want that direct communication, that explanation about what investors want them to report and how they'll use that information. Because you can push lots and lots and lots of information into the public domain. It doesn't actually make people better informed if it's not giving them insights that they need to take the decisions that they're responsible for taking. And so I do think over multi-year periods, we're seeing better disclosure. But you have to recognize, or we certainly recognize, that a conversation today is not going to necessarily lead to a better outcome in six weeks' time. Sometimes that's going to take several years because companies have to build the data gathering capabilities, they have to pull the data together and work out how best to present it, and so on and so on. And so you have to be realistic about timeframes over what, which some of these things can be achieved. But when 90% of your in, um, investment is in index funds, your, your perspective is forever. Yeah, on behalf of our clients it is. I mean, it is ultimately long term. And that's why we can afford to be patient and get the reporting right and get the practices behind the reporting um, to be you know, fundamentally more robust. Um, the main point of engagement is not to get a pretty shiny, glossy thing over here that distracts you from the terrible business practices in, in, in reality. And so we're trying to you know, work with companies, provide the feedback um, to encourage them to do this in a, in a really sound and thoughtful way, in a way that makes sense for that company and its sector and its business cycle. Thank you. So let me turn now to Eva. Uh, from the standpoint of Value Act, which obviously has a much more selective approach to investments, and so you can take a very uh, targeted uh, approach, very thorough analysis, and your perspective would be great. Sure. Well, I think the first thing to consider is that um, when, when I get asked how sustainability or ESG or impact or choose your favorite word is a part of our investment process, I think it's important to think about uh, process versus product. Um, and I make that, uh, I distinguish those because we do both. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, as part of process, I consider incorporating ESG risks and opportunities into diligence of a company um, and understanding um, what over the long term may, may create or destroy value. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of, uh, I think, what Michelle was talking about in terms of the ESG, material ESG factors. Um, that is something which we um, <coughs> seek to, to do across uh, all of our investments. Um, on the product side, um, what we have actually, um, just in this past year, uh, launched a new product, which is 
uh, uh, has an investment thesis um, that companies which are providing solutions to environmental and social problems um, should, should be recognized for that value uh, that they're creating in the markets. Some may call this impact, we don't really use that word, but um, essentially that, that is a specific product um, that is focused on environmental and social issues. So first of all, I think it's important to, to kind of lay that out. Um, and then uh, kind of to your, to your previous question about um, kind of disclosure and standards, because we have such a concentrated portfolio, to your point, as opposed to what Michelle's team is, is dealing with, you know, our, between, the, between our two funds as a firm, we're probably never invested in more than 30 companies. And so we have the luxury to really dig deep into each. Um, and that, obviously, it's, it's important for there to be kind of an apples to apples comparison um, on sustainability metrics, the same way that we have for financial metrics. Um, but we're less concerned with exactly which standard is being used because it'll be so different, to your point earlier, you know, depending on the context or the sector of the company. Um, the other point I would make is, you know, we, we also have a unique seat because we do sit on the boards of some of the companies we're investing in, and obviously that affords us a different level of access to information beyond what's available in the public domain. So again, you know, we can, we can engage with management um, a little bit more deeply. So you have, being invested in a relatively small number of companies, you have the luxury, if you will, of doing a much more in-depth qualitative analysis and are thus able to make subjective judgments with greater confidence. And if, could you just speak a bit to how you, uh, how you would look to measure uh, success in the context of such a concentrated position uh, based on ESG criteria? Sure, yeah, so first of all, I would say it's not just qualitative, it is, you know, in fact, can be quantitative, again, particularly when we can get into the weeds with, with the company uh, beyond what's, what's disclosed publicly. Um, I mean, our, I would say it's, it's very difficult to tease out um, in, in, the, the, in, in the concept of ESG, you know, when is there, when is, the financial success of a company tied to that specific ESG metric versus other things the company is doing, sure. because these are absolutely integrated into the whole view of the company, just alongside every you know every other factor that we're looking at. Um, so I don't know if that's what you were asking, but you know we wouldn't look at it quite that way. But um, certainly over over time, um, as we are engaging with companies, we would like to see progress on whatever the specific issue is. And, and again, that issue will depend on the company. It may be, for example, um, you know how a company is. Um, retaining talent or engaging their employees. And so in that case, you know, we would want to see that there isn't key talent at that company exiting the company, right? That, that would be sort of the evidence that that, that, that is working. Um, if it's, for instance, um, in, the, in this uh, new fund, which we've just launched that I described, which we're calling the, the Spring Fund, um, we're invested in AES. This is an independent power producer that's uh, transitioning from coal power generation to more renewable generation. There clearly there's a target, uh, uh, excuse me, a metric for the carbon intensity of the fuel that they're using, and so we can track that over time. But again, it'll, it'll be different depending on what the, what the particular investment is. So when you in, engage in, and I think you're serving on the board of a company called Unify, a smaller company than AES, but a very interesting mm -hmm. company I'd like you to, to, to speak to briefly, to what extent uh, well, if you could sort of balance how you perceive such an investment opportunity uh, on the assumption that the company is currently undervalued because the market doesn't appreciate uh, the longer term attractiveness of its, of its uh, unusual business strategy, if you will, and to what extent do you feel that you can engage with management to bring perspective to the table that they may not otherwise have to enhance their performance. Are you asking specifically because we're focusing on ESG, does that kind yes, of afford yes, us a different? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I would say, so I'll get to Unify in a second. I would say in general, what we're finding with, uh, when we're engaging with companies is that they're actually quite eager to be discussing e these ESG issues. Um, I think companies recognize that they, um, they're, they're important to m many different stakeholders. Um, they increasingly, I think, are, being asked by investors, but it's also consumers, employees, supply, uh, 
customers, suppliers, et cetera. So uh, they recognize that they may need to, to do better. And so for an investor to engage with them specifically on these issues, I think um, you know, they, they welcome that. Um, they welcome the help, they welcome the insight. Um, and uh, in, in our case, when we're getting involved, we're also being uh, the long-term investor in the room who is actually willing to help that company make some shorter-term investments that may, in the near term, not look so good um, in terms of the performance of the company, but we know that for the long term, it's creating kind of the company of the future. Um, so those engagements are, are, um, are, are quite productive. Um, and in the case of Unify, I mean, it's, it's really uh, the perfect example because this is a, um, an, a, a sort of old school uh, industrial company that manufactures yarn for uh, apparel and upholstery. It's a manufacturing company. Um, and simply because it was a, another good source for raw material, they have over time increased the amount of recycled uh, polyester they're using as opposed to virgin polyester, which they're sourcing the recycled from uh, plastic bottles. And so this was a business decision. This was not a sustainability decision. Um, over the last few years, the company has actually gone to the point where um, they've uh, uh, built a bottle processing plant, which is in fact taking dirty bales of bottles, sorting them, cleaning them, and doing what they need to do to pelletize them. And again, it's to capture more of the value and to be more efficient. It's not because they're trying to be sustainable. Um, of course, there is a sustainable benefit to that. And, the, and as they ramp up those operations, and become more efficient. And also, you know, there's at the other end of that piece of apparel that has that recycled product, there might even be a premium, right, that consumers are willing to pay for this more eco-friendly product. And so, the company is now being able to capitalize on what really was a, a, a good business decision. So again, they're, they're very eager to engage on, on that because they, they're seeing that they're well positioned for that. Are, are you finding with the companies that you invest in uh, where you're, you're making this longer term bet on the, the strategy tied to, to ESG performance, uh, and obviously AES would be an example of this as well, that you're giving the company a certain amount of street cred with the investment community because you've done the due diligence, if you will. Is that helpful to them from an investor relations I hope standpoint? So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as someone that's focused on sustainable investing for the last 10 years of my career, you know, I hope that you know personally I can also bring that. Um, you know, that's 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 part of the reason that I, you know personally I'm, I'm you know I, I've I've chosen to do this. Um, I yeah, but absolutely, I think that um, you know if we can be uh, thoughtful, mindful uh, investors who can prove that companies that in fact are providing these environmental solutions you know, can be recognized in the market with you know, some premium attached to that or you know, some, some returns attached to that, then I would absolutely consider that to be you know, evidence for other companies to come and do the same. Well, I'm just thinking that, you know, as, as you said, that you would encourage a company to make certain investments potentially at, at the uh, cost of immediate, some cost of immediate financial performance. And to the extent that you're there engaged with the company, I, I would think that might provide some cover with other investors. That's yeah, absolutely. And Jeff can probably speak in the next panel about AES, but I think that's absolutely the case there where, um, you know, coal um, is attractive to investors because it generates you know, near-term dividend for them. And so they, they, in the near term, fear losing that if the company is divesting from that coal, for example. Um, but we see the future of the utility and, and power generation you know, in renewables and not in coal. And so you know, in order to survive the longer term, you know, that's, that's part of the, the price we have to pay. Right, okay, thanks. Okay, Charlie, on behalf of, of Jana, if you could speak to your overall investment philosophy in this space, and then we can talk about perhaps some examples. Sure. Um, so, uh, I assume a lot of people aren't familiar with Jana. Um, we are traditionally known as a, um, uh, a shareholder activist. Um, um, it's not all we do, but it's one of those things where if you do it once, it's, it's what you're known for. Um, <laughs> we um, um, are also um, more recent entrance into the uh, impact uh, um, investing space. Um, you know, we historically have, have pushed for things like, um, uh, you know, recapitalizing the balance sheet or restructuring the business or changing management or board members. 
Um, you know, the, the real impetus behind the fund was that, um, you know, really the, the kind of divide between what we at least thought of as kind of traditional shareholder concerns, which are, you know, near-term events that we think will create value both in the short term and the long term, uh, and the kind of ESG crowd concerns, which were, I think, thought of as, as being out on some kind of distant horizon. Um, as the world gets to be a more complicated place in the face of environmental change and, and societal change and, and certainly technological change, which was the, the focus of our first campaign, uh, that distance is, is really shrinking uh, every day. And, and those, um, those factors um, are, are um, very much so not theoretical uh, in terms of the impact they're having on companies and, and shareholders and other stakeholders. Um, I think, you know, um, Activists, I think, as a rule, kind of respond to market inefficiencies. Um, 20 years ago, when Jana was founded, um, you know, the inefficiency was that you had, you know, companies who um, either the you know, CEO was an empire builder and, and wasn't focused on, on you know, uh, return on investment to shareholders or, um, uh, you know, was paying themselves as if they were performing really well and they're not. Um, I hope Marty Lipton doesn't charge the stage while I'm, I'm talking about this, but, uh, and, uh, uh, or, you know, people running with like it was a family business or it wasn't anymore, and shareholders didn't want that, but for most of them there was an inefficiency that they didn't have kind of the time and the resources uh, to, uh, uh, to devote uh, to doing something about it. I think there's a similar kind of inefficiency in the market today, uh, which is that, um, uh, you know, the average tenure for a, a CEO of a S&P 500 company is something like four years. I think it's like 4.1 or 4.2, uh, and you know most management uh, compensation packages uh, are structured in, in kind of accordingly uh, short time horizon. Uh, but you know, as Michelle pointed out, uh, increasingly both because of the rise of passive uh, uh, index uh, type investing and the growth of millennials uh, in terms of investors, um, that's not really where the growing number and and, and uh, probably most shareholders' heads are these days, and, they, and they're thinking about true sustainability, which is not where you're gonna be in a year or two, but you know, where you're gonna be five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And as part of that entire fabric, where you're taking the economy, where you're taking society, where you're taking the planet. Um, so it just seemed ripe, uh, I think, during a, a time when everybody kind of wants to be doing something um, uh, that they uh, um, can feel good about, uh, but also you know, calls on things that they know how to do. Uh, to take the only thing that we really know how to do, which is you know push companies for for change that we think will create value, and apply that to this space. So this, I mean, you commented to me that uh, for some this might be perceived as a radical pendulum shift on the part of of Jana, right? And if you could just you know comment on that, sort of reconcile that implied tension, if you will, or. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I guess that would be for, I mean, two reasons. Um, you know, one, I think there's a perception that, you know, because we've historically focused on near-term events that we don't care about uh, the longer term or probably more, uh, um, you know, put it more bluntly, that, that, you know, the things that we do to create value in the short term kind of necessarily comes at the expense of long-term value. Um, I think, you know, our track record, uh, you know, belies that. Um, um, I think that the research kind of, you know, rebuts that too, but um, I think it's more just they're kind of on different points of the spectrum. And I guess the other thing that's, you know, very different is, you know, typically the value um, arguments we've been making are very, you know, X plus Y equals Z. You know, um, spin off this underperforming division and, and, you know, remain co will be valued at this multiple and, and spin co at, at a different one. Uh, or you know buy back this much stock, and you know you know exactly what the new denominator is going to be, and it's all very um, uh, concrete, and and it's typically the thing that's driving um, the majority of the value creation over the you know kind of foreseeable future. Obviously, uh, ESG impact investing is very different. Um, I think the 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 nice thing though is that you know the majority of of, of uh, you know, the value in the public markets these days tends to be in intangible things, you know, as Michelle was talking about, like, you know, engaged employees and, and brand value. Uh, and, and um, you know, you, you have a robust R&D pipeline that people value beyond just what they can, you can see in it, things like that. 
Oh, sorry, I mumble. Uh, I was just saying that you know a lot of the the if you, if you just focus on x plus y equals z uh, in terms of whether it's a share buyback or or you know spinoff or something like that, yes, that's very easy to calculate, and that's how people I think traditionally think about activism. I think what you know we're doing, and obviously have a uh, and value act in a different way, but. Uh, maybe based on a similar thing is, is the idea is that if you only focus on that stuff, you're missing where probably the vast majority of, of long-term future value creation in the market's gonna be uh, uh, over the long-term given, uh, again, that the, you know, most value you find in, in big companies these days is gonna be in the, the long-term decisions they make, not the, you know, how big is the buyback gonna be this year or, or should we you know, restructure the company this way or that way? Could you comment on your, um uh, intervention at, at Whole Foods, which, you know, I think certainly had a, or has a, you know, ESG patina about it for those of us arguably higher end shoppers who love Whole Foods. And I think you found, you thought that the, the business was substantially undervalued. And I'm wondering if you could just speak to that. Yeah, sure, and that's an interesting one because um, you know, that was not an ESG uh, investment for us. It wasn't to, um, Sorry, no, I'll tell you why. She'll tell me later. Uh, it wasn't the idea that, you know, you put the company in the hands of a better operator and then, you know, more people are eating healthy food. It was basically that, um, and as um, I think, you know, Michelle referred to, you know, governance is, is always kind of a, a factor that can uh, be a, a, you know, kind of smoke that leads to the fire of other things. It was a company where um, I think it's, it's fair to say the governance was not good. Um, you know, you had a board that, that most of the members had been on so long that I don't think they would have qualified as independent under, you know, Michelle or Rocky's kind of uh, standards. Uh, and, um, you, know, you know, people were setting up organic food companies so they could, directors, so they could sell into the, the company's supply chain. Um, the result that we were looking at that time was poor operational performance. So, you know, we sent people into the stores and we put you know, little stickers under the, you know, the, the, like the Brahmers, really expensive soap that goes at the head of the store, the head of the aisle, and, because that's where you're supposed to put the high volume stuff, and you come back three weeks later, and that same bottle would still be there. So, you know, the governance problems there were an indicator for us that um, there are operational problems. So, we put together a, a, a board slate um, of uh, people like Glenn Murphy, who helped turn around the gap, uh, including by raising wages, um, uh, the person who really got kind of Harris Teeter off the ground and built it to what it is, and, and other folks who really had kind of a reputation for creating value. Uh, and it you know, got contentious, unfortunately. I think he called us you know, greedy bastards. Uh, I know he called us greedy bastards. Uh, but, um, and at the end of the day, he decided, and the board agreed, that they would sell themselves to Amazon, which um, so far, at least from what I'm hearing, is um, prices are better. We'll see about the shelves are sufficiently stocked. Uh, but. Um, uh, it's just an interesting dynamic because, um, you know, it was a situation that potentially could have been an ESG uh, type investment, uh, but, you know, we came at it from a different angle. And it, but it's interesting, you were drawn there initially because of the perceived shortfall in terms of governance practices. Well, it was a shortfall in what we thought the intrinsic value of the company was, but yeah. yeah the, but that, was a, the that was a real indicator of deeper operational issues from your, from your perspective? Yeah, it typically is. I mean, it it's, tends to be a theme uh, in, in activist campaigns, you know, along with um, you know, other things like compensation that's out of whack, or um, oftentimes it's, it was once a family business, or maybe it's the you know, founder's you know, son or daughter, and it's still kind of being run that way. So yeah, but one of the kind of persistent themes is, is something's out of whack with the governance. Okay, so I'll turn now, and let me just sort of prime the pump, if you will, if when we're finished uh, with panel immediate discussion, if there are questions from the audience, we'd certainly be open to taking them. So, Rocky, on behalf of State Street. All right, so, so um, my role really at State Street is to establish how State Street Global Advisors is gonna consider ESG, or environmental, social, and governance factors in its investment decision making. And so what are ESG factors? We look at them as low probability, high impact factors. So the probability of something going wrong is low, but when it goes wrong, it's the impact significant. So think of the company that didn't wash lettuce, a food company. 
what happened to the value of that stock. Think of uh, a financial company that had bad sales practices. Think of the oil and gas company that didn't invest in uh, safety, right? So these are, but, but now it's not just only about risk, it's also about alpha generating. And for all the reasons that my panelists have talked about, whether it's uh, attracting the right employees, it's uh, uh, being there first, uh, and uh, leveraging and positioning your business to uh, capitalize on a change uh, that's happening. So uh, how do we do it? And there are many styles of ESG investing, uh, but I would say that for, on one end, it's the exclusionary style, which is the sin stocks, don't want to invest in tobacco, et cetera. Then somewhere in the middle, you have the integration. You're integrating ESG into your strategy. You could have a positive screen where you're taking only picking the best in class or you're excluding the worst. Um, and then you have impact investing, which we've talked about here and my, uh, and, and my panelists are uh, part of. And then uh, on the other spectrum, it's, it's asset stewardship. It's you know invest in everything and mitigate risk from a fiduciary perspective and engage uh, on it. So we have the gamut. We don't, we're not really uh, in the space of, uh, act, uh, of impact investing, but otherwise uh, we have a gamut of, of uh, products and solutions out there. Um, so let's talk about uh, stewardship. There are many themes that have come up and I'll try to address all so you don't have to ask me follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, let's talk about stewardship. So, Yes, uh, stewardship for us is about creating value, not values. Uh, it is about uh, a case by case uh, for companies and understanding the ESG risk uh, and opportunity in the context of the company. Uh, I think our program, uh, and uh, with the breadth of that that we invested in, uh, we prioritize based on sector. So every year we'll pick up. Uh, three sectors, and then the idea is over a five-year period or three to four-year period, you've actually gone through your entire portfolio globally to understand what are the big ESG risks and sectors, and so you educate yourself, but at the same time, you're also bringing up thematic issues or issues with companies which are specific to the companies. And then you have thematic issues that are of importance that can really create risk across your portfolio, such as climate, water, pay strategies, uh, et cetera. Uh, one uh, of the big bits about stewardship that has come about is our program is designed for impact. So we do say that you know, if, you, if you think of us as invested in an index, Right. The, typically, if it's, since it's a risk-based approach, you're really talking, uh, while, while you will be monitoring and talking to some of the large companies and the ones who actually do it well, you're also talking and, I, and screening out, particularly when it comes to proxy voting on the outlier companies. If, if you plot all your investments on ESG, in a, it'll be an inverted U-curve like everything else, and you're going to be focusing on the outliers. Right. And so it's about, uh, and, and what we, the way we are looking at it is, if you actually improve the outliers, you're changing the shape of the index and you're improving the entire index, quality of the index. So that's one of the ways we think about how we're looking at ESG. Now, specific to what we're asking companies to do with regards sustainability, we uh, in 2017 said that we want boards to incorporate sustainability into long-term strategy. Well, what does that mean? And I like to give the example of Pepsi. So in mid-2000s, Pepsi uh, sat, board sat back and said, what's the biggest risk to our business? And the answer was not Coca-Cola. The answer was health and obesity. And what did Pepsi do? It didn't stop selling Pepsi. What it did was it started shifting capital allocation to buy uh, juice companies, water companies. Uh, it started innovating in things like baked chips, which we take for granted today, uh, low sodium uh, chips, etc. So what it was doing was pivoting. Now, while it was doing, because these are long-term changes the company is making to its strategy, while it was pivoting, it was a target for an activist. It underperformed. Coca-Cola stock. Fast forward X number of years, it has actually outperformed 
Coca-Cola, and Coca-Cola is playing catch-up right now. So when you, uh, or they started a few years ago, but anyway, but when you uh, think about that, so, so we, we put this guidance out, uh, and we started measuring companies. Now, I will say that it's not, uh, sci it's not like we, it's an art a sci and not a science. Uh, we're trying to make it a science, but we start, uh, analyzing companies on three factors. Have they identified the material ESG risks? Have they measured the ESG risks? And have they uh, communicated the risks? And based on these three, we actually tier companies. And at this point, we're just having these conversations with companies to let them know how we think about them or what we think of their reporting. And we found that, and on average, like. At this point, based on the companies we've engaged with on sustainability and looking at the quality of the reporting, uh, only about 15% of the companies actually are tier one, which is where they do it all three very well. 23% uh, are tier three, that means they just do one or none of the three things that we're asking for. And uh, a bulk of them, over a majority of them, are in the two bucket. So we also put out guidance for board of directors. So one of the things we do is we put our thought leadership on how we'd like to approach it. This allows boards to have a viewpoint that they take in, and many of the uh, directors have said, we, use your, we, we share your thought leadership and then they debate it. Like, okay, so why or why not? And one of the things we've done is we've asked boards, have you identified the material factors? Have you analyzed and incorporated into strategy? Does uh, the, uh, how does that impact your capital allocation? Uh, is the board, uh, or does the board have the right skill sets to oversee and understand ESG risk? Uh, how do you report it? And more importantly, how does that, uh, how is that incorporated into performance and compensation? And so uh, I would say that uh, most directors are not very fluent with ESG or with the ESG risk facing the company. Uh, depending on some sectors, they're starting to get better. So the high impact sectors uh, that have been at the forefront of it, you, you uh, hear some uh, good, uh, and, and you can basically tell a company or a board when the, bo when the director doesn't go silent and, uh, and look at the sustainability head to answer the question, when the director can uh, answer the question from a risk basis that we are looking at. Uh, the, the question of data and data quality came up and, and uh, completely agree, we want data to be measurable, consistent, uh, and uh, comparable. And uh, that is a problem right now. And so we are actually supportive of the SASB, Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, where uh, we say that it may not be perfect, but it's got the invest, it was developed by investors with an investor viewpoint, and it's a starting point for us. And I'm going to answer the question of what is material and not material by giving you an example of what is non material ESG uh, uh, disclosure. So uh, there was a financial services company that was, and most financial service companies are very good at, at explaining how they manage carbon and how many times they sh turn off lights and et cetera and all that. Uh, and and um, so this company was actually reporting a metric which was carbon emission per employee. And uh, they had some layoffs. And so I got a call saying that, you know, uh, we've actually done better, but because we had layoffs, the emissions actually went up. And I said, well, that's probably an immaterial information that you've just given me. Uh, and big, uh, or the way you're, where, where you're measuring and um, capturing that data makes no sense to me. So as an investor, I don't really use that information anyway. So I think that's an example of uh, you know, good versus bad, uh, just by showing you what bad looks like. So it, it, as you're speaking to this, it's, it's clear that you're reflecting a very in-depth perspective on a number of companies to which you spoke, right? So this requires a substantial degree of engagement. And if you could talk about the resources, the resource issues associated with being able to do the kind of analysis that you're talking about, the criteria that you're looking at, and you know the judgments that you're presuming to make 
uh, as you uh, consider investment, engagement, proxy voting, and, and, and the like, because um, it's what you're implying, at least to me, is a pretty hands-on approach to these, to these issues, which obviously entails significant commitment of, of resources. Right, and you also have to be smart. You have to realize technology is amazing, yeah. and uh, data is amazing, and I also want to um, point out that uh, most, no, super majority of directors get re-elected with 99% of the vote. So it's really about identifying the outliers and having good screens. So you don't have to go, and we don't talk to every company out there. Think about it, right? Ha the top 10 companies in an index account for probably 15 to 20% of the market cap, right? So you have to uh, look at both. And so think of stewardship. We have two levers to stewardship, engagement and voting. And you, a good program knows when to use engagement and when to use voting. So I'll give you an example. In, in Asia, most of the companies in emerging markets, not just Asia, are controlled by either a government or a family. Is my engagement, do they, they don't even really care what I have to say, right? They only care when it's a majority or minority vote, where my vote really counts. So do I have to have an engagement program or can I allocate my resources where there's an engagement culture, where boards are listening, where boards are responsive, right? So you balance your proxy voting guidelines and your engagement uh, program to address and get a breadth of both and use both these tools. And so we, uh, with about 700 engagements a year, uh, talk to about 45% of our AUM in equity. And that's pretty good. And that includes very small companies. And you don't just look at your absolute holdings. You look at your relative holdings because that's where, guess what? You're the big fish in the small pond. So their engagement is more effective. So I think people have this notion that just having numbers and you need to have a lot of people, you need to be smart about it. There's strategy that goes into stewardship, and engage, which is both proxy voting and engagement. And what also comes across in your comments is the extent to which today you're placing greater responsibility on the shoulders of directors who, uh, I mean, the, the expectations today as a consequence of evolving uh, regulatory requirements, best practices, uh, uh, pressure from investors, the, the standards to which directors are held today are, are much higher, right? But you're specifically talking about what you expect of, of, of boards. And, you know, Michelle spoke to the importance of, of, of governance. And, uh, you know, Charlie talked about the uh, governance shortfalls at, at, at um, Whole Foods, which were an indicator of, uh, of uh, broader challenges that were impacting enterprise enterprise value. And I guess, you know, a counterexample that I would throw out for a discussion just for uh, folks to address is, uh, and, and not to pick on individual companies, and you cited several examples without mentioning names, uh, but I think we all knew who you were talking about. I can think of one company previously headquartered in Fairfield, Connecticut, which had clearly had stellar governance practices. By any governance measure, um, you looked at the composition of the board, the background of, of board members, their practices. Uh, you know, there had been a lot of commentary about how they were, you know, clearly best in class for, for governance. And yet, uh, there were deeper challenges there. And without picking on any one company, uh, just to talk about um, the importance of governance and yet what you have to be uh, mindful of that uh, say a certain check the box uh, mentality may present uh, the right kind of public image, but but mask uh, deeper deeper problems. I mean, I would think you know if today you saw a company that a prominent company that had no women on the board, you'd say, well, there's something wrong here in the culture of the company. But you could have a situation, as I as I suggested, where 
you know, all the right boxes have been checked, and yet uh, beneath the surface uh, there were challenges that were not evident simply in the, in the public disclosure. I, I completely agree, though there was one issue, and if, I, if I've put the puzzle together and I think it's the right company, the one thing that kept standing out was board size and marquee boards. And so with every, uh, I would say, incident, the one thing we, we learn what to ask and we evolve our program. So guess what? Very large boards ask, is a screen. Marquee boards does not mean good governance anymore, right? So I think that's something that uh, we acknowledge that uh, we'll never catch everything, but uh, we let, let not a good, I guess, uh, crisis go to waste or a scandal go to waste. We learn. All right, so uh, questions from the floor, which are, and unfortunately we cannot accommodate press questions uh, today under the ground rules of the conference, but other, others attending. Yes. Could you just, yeah, identify yourself, yeah. Yeah, we hear it uh, quite a lot. Um, the other thing that we hear from CEOs and in those same companies, their corporate responsibility officer or whatever that role might be entitled, um, is our investors never ask. And I think that shows a, a sort of naivety on the part of companies that investors are going to say, oh, oh, I have an ESG question for you. because. If you're asking about things that have an environmental or social dimension to them, but are core to the business, those are business operational issues. The other thing, and to get back to your, your lawyering framework, um, that I think companies are a bit naive about, is there is a ton of information in the public domain that companies don't report themselves, or don't understand that they're reporting that is available to investors because of technology, as Raki was saying, such as, you know, and, and this was a, a core part of a major incident that happened in the Gulf of Mexico, not naming names, um, you know, a series and over many years of low level um, employee accidents that had to be reported to the regulator but weren't material under SEC definitions, therefore didn't have to be reported in shareholder communications. Technology can scrape that data now in a way that 10, 15 years ago, you'd have to be a real governance nerd to go to the basement of OSHA and file through all of those things to find that, that, that sort of insight. And so there's the role of technology in drawing to the surface insights that companies don't understand investors are seeing. The data aggregators are pulling together information and they're making estimations on behalf of companies that don't report, and then companies get upset about that. So I think companies need to move forward a bit and realize that it's better to tell your story yourself and provide the data you think is useful to investors um, and engage around that to make sure that you're continuing to evolve that practice, because otherwise investors are using information a company doesn't necessarily have a role in shaping the message around. So, so the only thing I'd add is uh, we put out a blog uh, the other day is that I think the most important question the boards are going to be asking three years from now is what's our ESG score? And the reason is because of ESG investing and the growth of ESG investing. We manage over $200 billion 
of assets in ESG. So using that scoring that, uh, that is available to us may not be the best score, but companies using a reporting against SASB and using accounting standards can actually start controlling that score. And, I, that, and, and the blog really was talking about how the ESG score, which is driving investments, is going to become almost as important as uh, the, your cu current uh, credit rating, which drives fixed in investments and fixed income. And uh, I, I, when, when, and I was at a director panel and I was talking about this, and, and they were like, wow, you know, we didn't even realize that this was happening. And there was a company that actually came to us and said, you know, we improved disclosure, and uh, our share ownership changed we suddenly had Europeans in our stock. And uh, it's thanks to ESG investing. Generally speaking, members of the panel see that, you know, looking out one, two, three years down the road, this is definitely a growth area. So is that likely to, uh, what's, what's the likely impact on returns to the extent that there's more money in this, in this space? Uh, from a risk return perspective? Well, yeah, I mean, will the opportunities diminish in consequence of, of, of more money chasing opportunity here? Uh, that's what, I guess, theory says. Like, uh, you know, it says, somebody said uh, in the past, uh, in the previous panel, everything reverts to the mean. But the idea is when investors include information and value the material information, and there'll be different ways of looking at that information. But the one thing that is clear is ESG is not a short-term play. It is a long-term play. So our active quantitative strategies have included ESG uh, and integrated into their active strategies, but they only act on it when it's an alpha generating uh, factor, or, uh, and, and it's shown to generate alpha. But even then, the returns only show up in year three. So it's not that it'll, even from an active perspective, it doesn't show up in year one or two. So you have to be a long-term investor uh, to, to uh, play in ESG. The hope is that we'll improve performance collectively overall over, over time. Right. Yeah. Okay, other, other questions? Yes. Wendy Gerber, president of the International Consulting Group, and I've been working with corporations on growing their businesses and at the same time focusing on a triple bottom line and ESG integration. And I have uh, a question for uh, the members here. In terms of, we've been focusing on ESG, ESG integration and what's happening in supply chain and business growth strategies. How is it also impacting your internal operations? Are you focusing on that in terms of really trying to embed sustainability into the DNA? And my second question is, to me it seems that this movement is really going to great, gain traction when it's both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And in terms of the bottom-up approach, I think that the public and consumers really can play a huge pivotal role in driving change. So how do we take Larry Fink's letter to CEOs and really use it to mobilize the public so ESG integration becomes table stakes Globally. I will answer the Larry Fink question, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in terms of um, how we think about um, ESG and our own business operations, I don't want to preempt the next panel because Barbara Novick, who's the vice chairman of BlackRock, is going to speak to that. So I'll leave that for that, se that session. Um, from our perspective, um, we, we absolutely see the role that employees in particular and customers play in influencing from the bottom up, if you will, to use your terminology, um, thinking around what is important for a company to understand. And the conversations that we've been having with companies about purpose following um, Larry's letter have been really interesting because while there's been a fair bit of commentary about um, are we in some way moving away from a capitalist model, actually the people who run businesses, so CEOs, CFOs, business um, heads within divisions, all fully understand 
how important this is to their employees and to customers and to others. Um, and I think we're actually already in a place where we're getting a lot of convergence about that feedback. And what companies, I think, have to get better at doing is communicating with those different audiences, to use Bob Eccles' terminology, um, to ensure that even if they have to use different language to those different audiences, the message is very consistent. I would just add on the, on the first question about um, ESG sort of becoming part of the DNA of the organization. You know, I think we um, find that there's, there, there, there's sort of, I think, a, maybe a sort of slightly historical um, view, and, and, and Rocky described a little bit also the, the range of types of ESG investing, of thinking of ESG as sort of a constraint or a negative screen, which that exists, and there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of that. But, but, you know, we think of ESG as, you know, additive in the research process. It leads to new channels of inquiry um, with companies. It opens us up to new kinds of um, experts or, or external um, sources of information that maybe we wouldn't look at before. Um, once we've experienced what ESG can do, whether it's creating or destroying value in a particular investment, we kind of learn from that. There's a feedback loop that we can follow up with when we see that kind of a pattern again in, a, in another investment. And so we may not use the label ESG all the time, but absolutely, I think it becomes um, you know, part of uh, just being a good analyst and analyzing companies. And you know, to me, okay. it's not ESG investing versus not ESG investing. It's just in good investing. Yes, back here. Uh, what, would you, sorry, what would you advise startups, since a lot of the discussions seem to be more oriented towards established companies, how would you advise a startup to implement good ESG policies given you know, the issues of profitability and you know, uh, the hustle to create the company for getting the infrastructure in place? Okay. So, so we don't invest in startups, but I'm happy to answer the question. <laughs> but uh, one of the, the thing, I think the idea that it's just a cost is just wrong, right? Because uh, it's, it's the, we, we often can't measure the benefits, uh, and that's why we say, oh, it's expensive for startups to do it. But startups actually, uh, I'd love to think, I'm not sure, but I would like to think that they have to attract talent. This ESG is not just about risk mitigation. It's also about making it a good place to work, about making sure you, you are good enough to, at some point, list. Uh, and I think that uh, people want to join companies, especially the millennials, want to join companies where uh, ESG is front and center. And I'll, I'll, uh, I, was at, uh, uh, I was at, I was talking to students at business school and uh, having uh, lunch with them, and one of them, uh, I realized the world had changed when one of them said, you know, I've gotten a job offer at Goldman, but I don't know, I really want to work in impact investing, and I'm really looking for a, the right shop and a startup, and I just looked, and I, I think I was dumbfounded. I said, when Goldman gives you a job, you take it. You know, so so I think that's that's how uh, how much ESG matters to this new generation. And, and I would just add on on that. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The hardest thing is to make the value proposition because a lot of the value plays out over an extended <coughs> period of time. So in some ways. Uh, Investing in really sound practices around your environmental and social impacts and good governance, because many startups fail because they have poor governance of just basic business operating standards. Um, the, you know, you're signaling that you expect to be around a long time and not just doing something that you can flog off to something established. I think we have time for just one more question. Over here. Well, that's about another two-hour panel, actually. <laughs> but in, 
In, in brief, um, you know, there are a number of reasons that you might engage, and, and one of them is around ensuring you have enough information to vote uh, and take a, a well-informed vote decision. Um, for us, we also run thematic engagements, either on a sectoral level or a subject matter level. When there's been an event, you clearly want to understand what, what happened, why it happened, and, and how the board and management are going to mitigate that. So that can be a series of, of engagements. And so, you know, it is always case specific about why you would engage. In terms of who we meet with, again, it comes down to the subject or, or the purpose of, of the engagement. What is on the agenda? Because if this is about board effectiveness and board quality, we want to meet with board members. If we're trying to sort of understand an operational area of the business, say how the company is thinking about water efficiency, just to keep on that theme, um, that would be someone who's got that practical business operating experience where they can talk through that. So that, that will depend. And on outcomes and effectiveness, it, it depends on the purpose of the meeting. So, and we will define objectives up front and then assess after the fact whether we felt that the meeting achieved um, those objectives, and then we monitor, because if we've left um, the company with a clear sense that we're expecting a response further down the track after they've had a time to reflect on our feedback, then we monitor and ensure that that is happening and perhaps have follow-up meetings. Yeah, I, I, I spoke a bit about our engagement program already, but I would say we spend a lot of time on impact since it's an impact driven, so a lot of measurement is very important. And uh, so, for example, uh, depending on the call to action, so with the Fearless Girl campaign, we identified companies in the Russell 3000, uh, and, and of course we also have expanded into Canada and Japan, but um, we said you, we want one woman on the board, and we've been spending a lot of time monitoring that, and the numbers came out today. Since the start of the campaign uh, on uh, International Women's Day last year, we've had over 300 companies add a woman to their board, and that's significant enough in the U.S. where uh, now on Russell 3, uh, at, at Russell 3000, the number of companies uh, with no women on boards has fallen from 24% to 16%. And this is uh, two proxy seasons or one and a half years. So I think that kind of measurement is important. And on a case by case, we also do, when it's an individual company, we look for responsiveness over a few years and then we'll um, uh, report. We tend not to name and shame, but we tend to name and, uh, and praise. And so in our annual reports where we give detail uh, insights into our program, we actually will call out companies that have been responsive to our engagement. So I, I could tell by the show of hands that the conversation is prompting a lot of questions, which is a reflection on the quality of the presentations made by the panelists. And I just ask you to join me in thanking them for really terrific discussion. <laughs>